everything from the food, the culture, the character, the, the people. Um, if when, you, when you think of Santa Ana in comparison to other cities in the county, I mean, just, you, 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 there's character to our city. There's character to our neighborhoods. There's character to, uh, to the people here. I mean, there isn't no uh, cookie cutter uh, neighborhood like you see in other cities. And that's something that I love. It's charming. Uh, you never come across the same person uh, more than more than twice. When you go to other cities, it feels like you see the same house and the same person, you know, over and over again. I mean, that's that's something that's beautiful about our city is just the the different variety of all of them, the different cultures too. You could find you know your best pupusa and your best taco. Santa Ana has a really special uh, element to it, which is the people and the culture and the pride. We're the fourth densest city in the country. We have up to 18,000 people per square mile. And when the disease, the infection occurs in that environment, it can spread like wildfire. So I knew we had to be very, very, very concerned, very uh, active, educating people, you know, making them wear masks, uh, you know, talking to other authorities trying to make sure we're coordinating with our fellow cities because the virus doesn't stop at city limits and we have to do it as a whole. We have to do it as a, as a, as a city, a county, a country, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, the whole nation, but, but it begins right here at home. March 15th is etched in my memory because I know that's when the governor issued uh, uh, the order that we had to shelter in place. And prior to that, uh, you know, I've been on the council since 2007. Our economy was as strong as I've ever seen it. Um, we had businesses that were growing and expanding. We had businesses entering the city. Uh, and so we were looking forward to what was forecasted to be one of our most successful economic years. Um, and we had plans that we continue to have, um, bringing in our streetcar, uh, bringing in new hotels, new amenities for our uh, residents, new services. But when the pandemic hit, we realized that everything was frozen in time. There was such a sense of uncertainty of what we were going to be experiencing that all we could do was just, um, you know, try to message and communicate to our residents that what's most important is our, our health, right? And we all knew back then that as a community, we might be one of the communities that's hardest hit because we have so many essential workers here. Um, and so that's the part that really was difficult for us to navigate, was to you know, explain to everybody that you know, not all of us here in Santa Ana have the luxury of staying home and working from home uh, uh, virtually. Uh, so you know, we had residents that were working in industries that forced them to be out of their homes. So they're working in hospitals, so they're working in supermarkets really making our economy continue to, uh, to you know, function. It was very, very different and difficult, and no one had a playbook to how to uh, deal with this pandemic. No one, no one at the federal level, uh, no one at the state. We have an idea, but to actually live it is a different story. Everything collapsing around, including the businesses, trying to keep them afloat, trying to, uh, you know, we went from shutting the business down to outdoor dining. It's been uh, a roller coaster. So it was difficult um, because we were getting mixed messages from the uh, other government agencies that were above the city. And, um, and they're the ones that have healthcare officials advising them. So we were doing what, what we could. You know, early on when, when the pandemic was hitting and we were 
um, meeting to uh, figure out what was going to be our course of action, one of the first things that we had enacted through our city manager was an executive order to enact a moratorium um, on evictions. And that was hel uh, helpful for our residents, but it was also based on some of the actions that were originally taken by the governor of California. So by having that in place, that was something that was not there before. You know, folks could be evicted for, for a variety of reasons, but in this case, it was important to keep people in place and not have them transient and not have them in a capacity where they could spread the virus. So trying to keep people stable and in place was something important. And I'm really proud of the fact that Santa Ana didn't wait for you know more suggestions from the state. We jumped out for as far as we were able to, thanks to the governor's action, we were one of the first, if not the first city in Orange County to look out for our residents and our renters and to protect them. We've made new policy, new regulations to ensure that that our our personnel are, are safe. So if we ever have something similar to the to this virus, we are prepared. Uh, for example, we've got the uh, permanent uh, partitions on many of our public counters, and we didn't think about that before, but uh, now that this has occurred, this is actually something that we should be doing in order to protect um, both sides, the public and our personnel. Here with me to discuss this alarming uptick in new cases is the mayor of one of the hardest hit cities in Orange County, Mayor Miguel Polito of Santa Ana. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you so much for being with us. As you now know, California has unfortunately the most COVID-19 cases here in the United States, even surpassing New York. Where does Santa Ana stand in that statistic? Santa Ana Mayor Miguel Polito not only works on policy at the local level, but he also has a regional approach in that he partners with all the big city mayors throughout California to strategize on different things like homelessness. And that group really pivoted towards coronavirus as soon as the pandemic hit. I'm working with big city mayors across the state where we coordinate best practices. And here in Orange County, we formed a coalition of 34 Orange County mayors where we're all in a campaign. Early on with the, um, the federal passage of the CARES Act, there was money distributed in California. Unfortunately, Santa Ana was not a direct recipient of it, but the County of Orange did receive those dollars. So um, first collaboration is we did seek some of that funding from the county. Uh, and then also we, we were in constant contact with the county. I was having weekly calls with them just to see what their interpretations were. And there were a lot of decisions that were left at the county level. Um, and we were, so it was hard to find out information a lot of the time as to what exactly is the County of Orange following? What are we doing in our community? And so um, from that, our mayor put together a coalition of mayors and it really was extremely valuable because you had the mayors communicating, trying to get the answers from the county and then being able to share the information with all of them. But uh, we did have to receive a lot of information from the county. So when the Federal CARES Act was passed, there was funding that was made available to counties throughout the country, as well as cities that had a population over 500,000 or more. So some of those cities in the Big City Mayor's Coalition received funding, but there were cities between 300,000 and 500,000 that didn't receive any funding, but we still had to provide services to our residents. And so it was those group of mayors that came together, as well as the Orange County mayors that Mayor Miguel Polito brought together to really advocate for funding. So after months, of countless meetings and multiple letters that were sent to the state, to the county, and to the federal government. We finally received a call from Governor Newsom's staff that we were gonna receive funding directly through the state of California. We had a short period of time to scramble to figure out where we can do this. And we put together a spending plan that included everything from testing all of the members in our community to serology testing, to a nurse's line, to utility assistance, to business assistance, to rental assistance, to childcare assistance, and put together a spending plan to present to council and they unanimously approved it. And from there, it was getting contracts in place and rolling them out. One of the things that makes Santa Ana so great is the people that work here truly are invested in this community. I have never known a city or city government 
that works harder to try to make a difference for the people that we all work for. So the city manager did mandate us to come up with a way to go out into our communities. A really novel idea. Nobody else in the entire country that I'm aware of was willing to take on the risks associated with taking staff out into communities to go door to door. Nobody was willing to do that, but Christine Ridge, our city manager was, and she gave us a mandate. She told us what she wanted to see. I got to sit down with some absolutely uh, incredible people. Uh, I think they are incredibly smart. Uh, and then that gave me an opportunity to uh, work with Daisy and together we came up with this idea that came to be known as the Corona Cares Caravan. A lot of the traditional methods just don't work here in the city. Um, and a reason for that is our residents are very different than the rest of the county. We have a much larger immigrant population here, much larger foreign born population here, much lower income. And so when we're providing a lot of different services, we have to really think outside the box and think about what's really gonna work for our residents here. Um, social media and just providing things on the website is great, but it's not gonna reach everyone. Um, and sometimes I think about how my parents would be able to find out about different programs or services that their city is offering. And I use them as a reference to how we have to adapt to be most successful to our residents. So to me, I think it's very important that we're not just providing these services, but that we are actually out in the community. And that's why I work really hard day in and day out to make sure that we are out on the streets providing this information and providing these services to the core of our city and we've expanded to basically reach every single neighborhood in Santa Ana. So how we selected the neighborhoods and where we focused our attention was actually based on data driven. Right? Literally four if not other six uh, zip codes in uh, not just in the city but in Orange County were the most uh, impacted regarding testing positive for COVID-19 uh, symptoms. We picked those zip codes. We isolated those zip codes and we focused on key neighborhoods in those um, in particular zip codes. So we chose, like I said, probably the most dense areas, what we were calling in the beginning our COVID-19 central, and we actually targeted those uh, neighborhoods for information and, uh, and assistance. As a code enforcement officer, we preserve and we enhance the quality of life in our city. For that reason, I think uh, code enforcement doing the CARES program was an excellent choice because we get to see our city in a completely different way and our residents also were able to talk to us and give us a little bit of feedback. And I think because they, they see who code enforcement is, they were a little bit more open to actually talk to us and ask us questions. At the beginning of the program, people really didn't want to ask questions. But once they saw that we are part of them, we're part of their community, they really opened up. And I think that was very rewarding and has been very rewarding for many of us. In addition to uh, having our traditional code enforcement um, duties expanded, we had 12 to 15 folks in my team. We actually hired um, COVID-19 relief workers on a temporary basis. We actually interviewed maybe 28 to 40 folks, literally in a, a two week span. We did have a few people when we explained that we would be going out door to door in the areas most impacted by COVID, just get up and walk away. Because what we were asking people to do was scary, right? Everybody was told to stay in their homes and we were telling people to go out. 
to what we called our COVID hotspots. And naturally there was a few people that didn't want to do it, but we ended up finding a really great team to help make this a reality. And using our court enforcement uh, officers as the staff and the leads, working with these new individuals, we actually had a training and an implementation and a hiring literally within 20, if not 25 days, you know, boots on the ground aspect. From idea, from concept to idea, to hiring to implementation, literally within less than a month. Usually the, the, the typical resident, every time they think of a city official or a code enforcement officer, it's something negative. It's something, you know, in their eyes, it's something bad. It's like, well, you know, what kind of fee do I have to pay or whatnot? But this time, we were able to go into neighborhoods for something positive, and that was to offer rental assistance, utility bill assistance, uh, census outreach, and, and offer free COVID testing. I mean, that I think was important and critical in, in, in us being out in the neighborhoods is getting to know that community getting our, our staff involved and, and getting our staff to know that community that they usually don't interact with in, in, in a positive way. So I think that was uh, important. Where folks were thinking the opposite uh, as far as technology and how do you have that safety, we still were mindful of the safety protocols, but we actually, like I said, went to those corners of the city that were the most impacted, that were the essential workers, that were not getting the services, and we made the very personal contact with them. We provided the information and we facilitated, more importantly, testing for COVID-19. That's something I'll, I'll be proud of for the rest of my life. One of the priorities with the CARES program was to be able to provide free testing to our residents. Staff received proposals from various companies and we were really picky as to what company we chose because we had very specific requirements for this community. We needed to make sure that they were mobile. We needed to make sure that they were able to provide test results back within a reasonable time. After going through an evaluation of various vendors, we ended up selecting Medica to provide testing services for our residents. Medica Testing Group provides COVID-19 testing to the city uh, with the partnership uh, of the city. Uh, we actually go out into the various communities of the city uh, through parks primarily, and we offer testing to individuals who reside here at no cost. The type of testing that we're, we've been doing is the PCR nasal swab test that is not as intrusive as the previous test prior. Uh, it's a self-administered ad administered test for individuals who are 12 years and older. For under 12, we ask the parents or the guardian to uh, provide the testing to the children. It's a very fast process. Generally, it, it'll take, with waiting time, under half an hour. Uh, from there, uh, tests are conducted throughout the day, collected, uh, and then couriered to the laboratory, where right now we're averaging about 28-hour turnaround time but it can't take as long as 72 hours. Uh, but throughout that process, we've got a call center. We've, we're obviously have internet access to track and to obtain information and resources. And we always have someone that can, uh, you know, assist an individual if they're having trouble with accessing, you know, their results. And through their results, uh, they're received via text or via an app that provides verification of whether or not you're positive or negative. Uh, if you're negative, you receive a certificate to the effect so that you can utilize it for travel and other purposes, return to work. And if you're positive, um, you get the support from our medical director and, and the team in terms of resources and, and education and guidance and referral if necessary to your uh, particular healthcare provider, if not possibly even emergency healthcare services. This is your, your basic COVID test that we provide here for free. And I'm gonna test myself because it's been a couple weeks that I haven't. So, I wanted to kinda show, you know, how, how this works. I mean, in all honesty, it's a little gross. So I didn't realize that I was gonna do it on camera. I thought I was just gonna do it for the staff here. But, you know, I haven't done it in a while, so it's good that I do it. If I can get this open, I should have probably pre-opened this, right? Um, so this is a, a typical
COVID test that we provide. So, what you gotta do is, you gotta make sure not to touch the, the little spongy tip. And this is the part that goes inside each nostril. So, here you go, okay? All right. Give me a sec. Okay. <laughs> this is probably a bad idea to do this on camera, but I'm doing it. And then you just open up the little cap and you toss it in upside down into the liquid. Uh, no, but it tickles. And I really, really need to sneeze, but you know, I gotta make sure that I'm tested and I'm crying now. It's okay. <laughs> and that is a standard COVID test. Get tested at least two to three weeks. Just because you don't have the symptoms, it doesn't mean that you don't have the virus. So we're just trying to protect our loved ones. So don't be afraid. We're not sharing your information with anyone else. This information will remain confidential with our lab and with our patients, you know. And I am very thankful for the city of Santa Ana for doing this for all the residents, you know, and it's for free. So don't be afraid, you know, to come out and get tested, you know. Any questions that you guys have, please contact us. Thank you. When you go to the doctor, they charge you. Here, it was for free. You did not need an appointment but trying to get the word out at the beginning was also very difficult because you know how it is. And sometimes people don't believe that we're actually going to be giving them what we're actually saying we're gonna be there for the next day. And I think once we, we were getting that momentum, people have started to come out and they truly do believe when we go out there and, and knock on their door and say, come out, we're here for you. I think now they're finally believing it. They're calling the number, the CARES number, where at the beginning maybe not that many people called. And because they're seeing it and they're actually receiving something in writing at their home, it's not just in the news. They're act we're actually providing also face masks. And I think that became um, kind of like a little pride of our city also, because everybody wants to stand in a face mask. We're proud of our city. The, the importance of the hotline has been so critical because there wasn't anything that was a dedicated uh, resource for everybody to access. And having a number that um, anybody could call and anybody could ask questions that were directly related or indirectly related to COVID-19 and its consequences. I think what we're seeing is that, you know, maybe not everybody has a computer and maybe not everybody's online. Um, but everybody has a phone. And so to have a central line where somebody could answer your questions, um, and what we've seen, because we have such a, um, a high population of Latinos uh, that are monolingual Spanish speakers, I think 80, 90% of our calls come from that part of the community. So to have somebody answer questions in your own language um, makes a big difference because you can take those, um, you know, take that information and make informed decisions and you know, help your family. And obviously you realize that these exchanges are so important because they're resources, but they really are in some cases, life and death, right? So to know how you can better protect your family and provide protection for them um, is, really, is really an amazing thing that we've tried to extend everybody. Even if they couldn't go online or if they weren't sure about going online or if they, you know, they didn't feel comfortable applying online, they could call the hotline and get information, um, as well as they at least had uh, the, the basic understanding of, of the fact that this program exists, that there are programs like rental assistance, um, utility bill assistance, and business grants that they could benefit from. And so, um, so we, we sent the postcards out, put up signage all over the city on, at like bus shelters, on billboards, we cast a wide net to, um, and, and outside of sort of our typical uh, communications channels to make sure that um, that everyone was aware of this program because that was the first step was uh, was awareness um, and then from there to continue promoting it 
and continue sharing information to, to get people to apply for these programs so we can help them. Our department was very heavily involved with the CARES initiative. Economic development specifically had three different types of business grants going resources for businesses, webinars targeted to Spanish-speaking businesses, webinars targeted to business owners that needed assistance in renegotiating rents. We were able to bring forward the isolation assistance program, artist grants, nonprofit grants, and business grants, all within economic development. The city has been very flexible with approach, with developing initiatives, with resources, there's a different viewpoint from the city to the businesses and residents now because we were all impacted. We were all uh, in the same situation and we became compassionate to people versus businesses or standalone individuals. Um, there was definitely a, a need and the city rose to the occasion and was able to provide uh, services to their best, of, to their best ability. We have three different grant opportunities available to our businesses. Businesses that are home-based, businesses with 10 and less employees, and businesses with 25 or less employees. We do have a specific restaurant and bar relief grant for those businesses that have 10 or fewer employees. We have approximately $3 million of grant funding available, of which approximately 50% has been spent. So there's still a lot of opportunity for some of our local businesses that are struggling to pay the rent or to buy material or equipment that they need for the pandemic to take advantage of these grants to really help their businesses through this tough situation. This pandemic blindsided everybody. The way it, the way it happened so abruptly, it hit our sector, it hit the, the food and beverage sector so hard with the abrupt stop in cash flow that it was hard for me to let my employees know, hey, you don't have a job. The very next day that it happened, we went from 47 employees to five employees. And it took about three months before we started slowly hiring and gradually bringing everybody on. So to sit down and have that talk with my employees was very rough. But also now that we're slowly and gradually getting busier, I have the opportunity to sit down with my employees and, and bring them on. The city of Santa Ana uh, offered a grant to small businesses and restaurants you know, took about an hour and a half to two hours to round up all the information to, to get everything together. The time spent is nothing compared to what the, the grant money was able to do to help out. I was approved for the uh, $5,000 grant initially, um, which was really, uh, it was kind of a weight lifted off my shoulders because it at least helped me at the time when I closed to kind of um, pay off any debts that I had pending. Um, and then it also, that grant specifically helped me to reopen uh, with having to buy supplies and whatnot because we were closed for so long. Um, and then it also helped me a little bit with the first couple weeks of payroll. We have such a wide range of businesses that have been able to take advantage of the assistance, of the grant assistance that we've been providing. We have a lot of local Santa Ana residents that own their businesses that are home-based businesses and they were able to use one of our programs to help them sustain them themselves during the pandemic closures. Their sales were down and they were not really generating any revenue and by this time unemployment really hadn't helped them. So being able to take advantage of the grant was really helpful for some of those home-based businesses. Additionally, there were so many beauty salons, nail salons that were forced to close. We were able to assist those types of businesses with funding to help them pay the rent during the closures. We also have so many bars and restaurants that were required to close and the bars specifically really had no source of revenue unless they sold food. So being able to help them with the rent or being able to help them with a grant that's going to help them reopen safely was really critical for them. But we also have a very wide range of businesses from tax services to photography studios to retail shops that all took advantage of our grant programs. I decided to open up my dance studio after being in the dance industry for 10 years. 
um, I decided it was time for me to open up my own dance studio because I have a pretty big following. That was March when we first opened up March 1st. And then March 15th, we got shut down because of uh, COVID-19. So it took a really big hit on us. We lost a lot of business. We lost over 70% of our membership sales. Grant money has definitely helped to pay rent for the studio and other um, expenses that, you know, didn't disappear when COVID hit. Santa Ana has always been this incredible hub of creativity, both in terms of the artists that live here and also arts patrons, people that appreciate um, that they have this scene here. Um, especially here in downtown Santa Ana, you've got these amazing schools around here who have incredible film programs, all the way to Henninger Elementary that has a, a great film program at the elementary school level, to OSHA, to Cal State Fullerton. Um, and, you know, the, the role of an art house institution like the Frida in communities like that, um, I have seen how uh, places like the Art Theater in Long Beach, the New Art in Los Angeles, um, the Roxy in San Francisco, um, the, the Logan in Boston, in, uh, Chicago, I mean, all these incredible theaters, um, the role that they can serve both not just to entertain and bring independent films uh, to the community, but also serve as sort of cultural institutions, sort of like a museum would, where the main art form at a museum, let's say, is the graphics on the wall, but they're also serving beyond that. They are bringing in civic engagement, they're bringing in music, they're bringing in film sometimes. They are identifying ways to serve the community's interests at a larger level. Um, and that is what I envisioned a place like the Frida could be, film at the fore, but not stopping there. Um, so it's been a, a privilege and an honor, I think, to, to see that vision through. Um, and, um, and my sort of vision and hope for how a place like the Frida could complement what was already so incredible and dynamic about Santa Ana, um, it's been a treat to see that come to fruition and to serve that role um, here at the Frida. Arts organizations were the first to be shut down and they're going to be the last to be opened up. To this day, they're still not opened up yet because they tend to have large gatherings. So they, I would say, one of the most impacted and it's hard to create art and continue that outside. Um, you know, there's some individuals can probably do it, but arts organizations are hit the hardest, nonprofit ones and even um, individual artists. It's hard for them to continue to make a living when they work for these organizations or when they work for schools or other things that have shifted and um, pivoted to different ways of teaching. So, so, for, so for a lot of them, they didn't know, they didn't know how to continue with their income and how to pay, make their next payments. Grant's helpful in getting me back to my art and in that I can, it gives me a couple of months of rent it lets me have some breathing room. I don't feel rushed. You know, obviously I'm still looking for work and things like that, but I feel like this is my time. I can, you know, go all in um, into my art. I have seed money for small projects that I've been wanting to work on. I'm working on a collection of my poetry and I just need to set my butt down at my computer and just get it done. So what I do as an artist, as a poet, as a writer, um, I collaborate with a lot of different um, community-based organizations. So hosting writing workshops or collaborating on um, arts and cultural events. So through COVID, I was impacted by it. Um, several events had to be canceled that I was helping to fundraise certain events. Um, some workshops also were canceled. So it was um, it wasn't a very interesting turn. For artists specifically, we offered um, artist relief grants uh, for individual artists, uh, as long as they were resident in Santa Ana and that they were practicing artists in some way. They don't have to make any money or living from their art from their art necessarily, but they were practicing artists. They got up to two thousand dollars, and for um, arts organizations. We, we gave them based on their budget, but they were able to receive grants up to $50,000 for the for the entire organization. They've been life-saving grants. It's the support they provide has been incredible. And they this, this latest one, especially because it is tied to COVID relief, but also allows for covering the costs of innovations, let's say, while you're closed, for example, temperature guns at the door. Like we're gonna go through and sanitize between every screening. We're gonna slow down the number of screenings per day we have. Obviously the capacity is gonna be cut dramatically less than what the county is allowing for, frankly. Um, 
But again, to be able to go a step beyond and say, hey, we have sanitized theater, however, if you'd like a sanitation wipe, and not to have to charge for it, you know, just to to be able to um, to further allow audiences to have an element of safety to make them feel safe um, is very important to me. I thought the city did a fantastic job responding to the artist needs. They they realized that artists are also small businesses and arts organizations are small businesses. So then they opened up the grants to include them, to include arts artists and, um, and art organizations in a way that was a relief and not just, um, you know, having to to produce anything. It was just, they understood that it was to relieve them because of the income lost um, and the effects of COVID. When speaking to businesses and residents in Santa Ana, the main topic of conversation was how are we gonna pay our rent, both for the business side and for the resident side. With loss of revenue, that is the biggest expense that a business owner or a family has in the city. So we had a lot of requests asking about what assistance would be available to help with rent. And the, luckily, the city was able to offer grants to both businesses and also rental assistance for residents to help them with those rent insecurities. Prior to the pandemic, uh, the extent of people's understanding of the housing crisis in Santa Ana uh, gets nowhere down and gets nowhere close to what it actually is. Um, let me give you a few examples. So when we opened up our Section 8 program waiting list in July 2015 uh, to provide rental assistance through our voucher program for 2,700 families, we received a total of 16,375 applications in just one single month. Uh, it was an overwhelming response. Uh, within the first hour of opening up the application, we had uh, jammed our server uh, because of the volume of applications we had received. We had a you know, healthcare.gov moment uh, in our own little application process for our Section 8 program. The demand is here, this is pre-COVID, the demand is here, the amount of resources we have is here. Nonetheless, our, our team uh, is relentless in our efforts to provide affordable housing for our community uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID, and during COVID. So we're, we're uh, doing everything that we can. In order to participate in the program, you have to be a Santa Ana resident. Uh, be, meet our income guidelines and be affected or impacted by COVID-19. And that just me merely means um, um, you have loss of job, a sickness, um, loss of hours, um, and you need assistance getting caught up with paying your rent. Uh, the city is providing $1,500 currently and is looking at expanding that to $3,000. Um, for those that apply, you can apply online. Uh, or you can uh, visit one of our own nonprofit organizations to pick up a application and submit that way. Fueron a mi casa y dejaron una un boletín que iban a estar cerca de donde vivo y con información. Entonces yo de ahí agarré la información y hablé a la ciudad para Yo hablé y me dijeron que estaba en proceso y que en hecho me iban a llamar cualquier cosa y sí me llamaron aproximadamente como a los 20 días y me dijeron que sí que felicidades que había este yo había sido elegida para que me ayudan con de la renta we were the first city uh, in Orange County to develop a rental assistance program and I was proud of that and we were able to because of that quickly grow it as we received more resources so we you know, ended up having about $10 million available for rental assistance. And that was, you know, real money to help our communities to stay in place, uh, to be safe, to uh, spend time with their loved ones during these times. A lot of times um, with federal funds, you have to prove that you're at threat of eviction in order to receive rental assistance. Thankfully, we've been able to provide rental assistance to all of the residents that are um, eligible uh, without having to be under the threat of eviction. So the moratorium has been extended, I think, two or three times, and it's expected to end um, at the end of January. And so what we have um, coming up is it's called the SAVES program, and this is a focus on eviction prevention. So when the moratorium ends, people will already, it's gonna open up in the beginning of January. So before the morator moratorium ends, people are going to be able to apply for rental assistance, and it's good for um, rental assistance um, 
back rental assistance up to six months and also going forward up to 12 months. So if somebody not only needs assistance now, but they're looking at a bleak future of employment or um, you know their health hasn't improved, then they have some safety net going forward. So we're really looking pr forward to launching that program. Our agency primarily does workforce development and economic development programs in Los Angeles and Orange County. Uh, those are programs where we help the unemployed find work and also where we help uh, small businesses access capital. Uh, those are the, and we do some other programs too, but those are our two main programs. And we're usually hired by cities or counties as a contractor, um, sub recipient to them to get the work done. And it's usually through a competitive bid or some type of uh, solic solicitation that were hired. Before March of this year, it was one world we worked in. And then uh, since March, it's been an entirely different world because so much has affected our customers in such profound ways. And it's also affected us and how we re-engineer our business and provide services. When the city of Santa Ana approached us for utilities um, and small business assistance, we knew that those were going to be very disparate um, populations applying. So those that are applying for utilities and then later childcare, those are going to be residents. Whereas the individuals applying for the small business assistance, whether they were small businesses with less than 25 FTE employees, so that's small, or a bar or restaurant with less than 10 FTE, even a little smaller, we knew that there was a gulf between them. And so we built a system that would be accessible for everyone, that was translated in multiple languages. We learned from the previous software that we used that maybe that wasn't as accessible. So we pivoted to a new platform. We researched that platform. We connected with that platform in advance enough to build out a system that we felt was accessible. Um, and then from that point, we also made sure it was mobile friendly, tablet friendly, but more importantly, we needed to get that office hours piece for people that didn't have the tablet, the laptop, or the desktop, or the teenager, um, or the family friend that could help them, that could come into their home and help them. The application process uh, for the grant um, seemed pretty simple for me. Um, it was through Submittable, um, and it was pretty clear, like very straightforward on some of the questions and the documents needed to submit was also really clear as well. Um, so I personally didn't need too much help with it. Um, so I think with folks that maybe need assistance with it, um, definitely it's possible like to get that assistance maybe through a family member. But it was really straightforward, very easy for me to submit. So one of the most important aspects of the resource component of the Mobile Resource Center is that residents are able to actually fill out their applications on site. Staff is trained on all of the various programs and they're able to walk them through the application process. They can fill out paper applications or mobile applications through our iPads that we bring with us. And then that way their information gets input in the system right away and they don't have to wait for a follow-up phone call. I definitely think that people need this help. Um, completely people come up to me, some crying, some telling me their personal stories. I've had people come up to me that their family members have passed away probably a week before. So I think that it's um, a very emotional time for all of us and their last worry should be about paying their bills, paying their rent. Three out of four of my household members all tested positive for COVID and um, I had one of my family members hospitalized. The city was able to help me be there as well. Um, for my family and to make them feel less alone um, by destigmatizing like testing, making that openly available is something that I think was really powerful because I think a lot of folks are very stigmatized by what COVID is and being impacted by COVID. But ultimately it's something that is, it's a worldwide pandemic. It can hit anybody, no matter what income, no matter what you do. During times of need is when people tend to show their true colors. And as far as working for the city of Santa Ana, I couldn't be happier um, in the people that I'm working with and the help that we've all been able to provide each other as we've had to go through this unprecedented time of policing and providing for our community during a pandemic. We have started to rebuild our trust in government from our residents. So a lot of residents live in fear right, especially all of the immigrants that live here. And we are a trusted resource 
that a lot of them are afraid to take advantage of because they feel like there's a catch. They feel like something's gonna happen to them. And I think by them seeing us out here in their neighborhoods, providing all of these services to them for free and just reiterating that there is no catch, that these services are for them, I think that's been one of the biggest motivators for me. In the future, everyone's gonna look back at what happened in their lives during the COVID era. And I think here in Santa, we're gonna be proud that despite you know, the troubling aspects of the coronavirus that our city staff uh, and city leadership team stepped up to put together a program that was well-funded and well-delivered. Uh, again, we were able to successfully lobby the state of California to give $28 million directly uh, to the city of Santa Ana rather than via the county, in which case, you know, I always worry that we wouldn't get really our fair share. Uh, so I'm pleased that we're able to lobby directly for that money, receive $28 million, and then program it again to the things that we really need in rental assistance, utility assistance, child care programs, and then testing and tracing. Uh, really, to at the end of the day, just keep our community healthy uh, and to rebuild because, you know, we are going to get through this. Uh, we may all be wearing masks for a little while longer, and I have my mask in my pocket, uh, but I know that we're doing everything possible to keep our community safe. I think Santa Ana has um, pretty much had an exemplary response to the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, we've implemented obviously a lot of public education measures, uh, messaging signs, you know, you have the CARES mobile teams, um, and then from the Public Works Agency, we've implemented the COVID-19 sanitization program. So we really attacked the virus and its spread on multiple levels and I think it's been an effective response. Typically for planning an event, it takes months. Even a, for a really large scale event uh, with multiple components, it could take even a year to plan. We only had weeks to plan this outreach. So a lot of people came, came to the table. We had police, we had traffic, we had city manager's office, we had parks and rec, we had public works. Definitely every department was essential in the planning of this outreach and we were able to do it in just a matter of a few weeks to get it off the ground. A lot of lessons learned. Um, my hope is that uh, as a police department and as a city that we continue uh, to invest in the leadership skill set that has been um, developed and is continued to be learned by various employees throughout the organization. Leadership matters and um, I, I, we, I can't say enough about it. And what we've seen at every level in the organization, city manager's office, uh, the various departments involved, um, really is an investment in making a difference, uh, rolling up your sleeves, and um, demonstrating genuine care for the people that we're here to serve. And, and that's my hope moving forward uh, for this entire city. Once the pandemic is over, my hopes are that the community will see how the city, as well as the police department, have done everything they can to try, to try to provide the best quality services to them. And my hopes is that that will help create a relationship between the community and the city, as well as the police department, as we move forward from this pandemic. Time and time again, staff working with our city council will submit requests to the state or to the federal government to fund different programs or services that we need in the city that go unfunded. And this is one of the few times where we were actually successful, right? We actually received a direct allocation from the state to provide those services. And the state really trusted us to deliver. And we took that funding and we gave it directly to the residents. And I hope that in the future, that these large government entities like the federal government and the state government continue to provide funding directly to cities because they have a much closer relationship to the residents. They're able to understand and determine exactly what the residents need to provide the services that are best needed for them. You know, it's been rough. It's been rough on us. I know that I, you know, would tell my kids, you know, I think we'll last through the summer. <laughs> Once the summer's over and we tough it out, we'll be fine in the fall. And then we realized that, uh, you know, this was going to go beyond fall. Now we're going into winter. And, uh, and, you know, now, you know, the expectation is we may go into the first quarter of next year. So, you know, I just want to thank everybody for being as responsible as they've been, because I know Santa Ana, 
uh, you know, our residents, they wear their masks, they distance, they wash their hands, they do all the things that they have been told to do because they realize it's such a critically uh, important, you know, thing for all of us to take care of one another. And you just don't do it for your own health. You do it for the health of others. You do it for the health of your family, but you do it for the health of your neighbors and people around you. So I just want to thank everybody for stepping up and, and, and doing something that's been incredibly different, difficult because had we been told in March that we would still be, um, you know, uh, you know, sheltered in place, having to, you know, live under the conditions that we're living in in November, you know, seven, eight months later, I don't think anybody would have imagined us being able to comply as well as we've done.